Good morning, campers, and welcome to Radio Camp Half Blood, a Percy Jackson read along podcast. I'm B, and I'm Zach. And this week we read some Leo chapters. Yeah, we certainly did. I feel like some of them, you know, there's a nice climax. Some things fall, some things change, but in the end, you know, everyone has a podcast. I guess even Hephaestus does. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. When I uh, when I read that, I was like, oh, this is extremely. Zach, this it makes a lot of sense why you have said that you are um Hephaestus cabin. Like it it just entirely tracks, really. It's kind of has all fallen into place. Yeah, the more I think about it, the more I start to become more Hephaestus, not because of the whole podcasting thing or like the secret pirate radio, but because that's like, just an added I bonus, love... but yeah. Well yeah, no, it is an added bonus, but for me, like I just love working with my hands and getting nitty gritty, but also like all the Hephaestus cap, and I'll have like a bunch of like super ADHD where you have to play with things and mess up things, disassemble and reassemble. Basically, it's a cabin built for me. Yeah, no, it's it's like eerily like you. It's it's kind of practically based on your personality. Yeah. How about the monkey wrenches and the grease and the uh, wood shop? Yeah, I remember um, <laughs> talking to Sarah. I, f- I feel like I've maybe made this joke before because it's like a running joke with us that... Um, my that a grease monkey which obviously is just a phrase for someone who is good at mechanics but just as a phrase is our worst nightmares because my worst monk my worst monkey my (laughs) worst fear is grease and her worst fear is monkeys so combined a grease monkey is like a nightmare i mean a monkey made out of grease probably would be terrifying to behold we're getting sidetracked almost immediately anyway do you want to hear the chapter title that i chose yeah yeah totally i'm now worried that there's a grease monkey lurking inside my house there's no grease monkey i could have done some sort of weird pun like that but instead i i kind of went with the more cinematic event um, in these two chapters which is leo crashes and burns ooh that's a really good one yeah that's Man, that's so good, actually. I feel like when it comes to this chapter, it does have, like, a big crash and burn at the end. Though, I think Leo bounces a couple times at the end, so I guess he you'd also put Leo bounces back. Yeah, there's, like, a, a couple angles I could have gone. Like, that's the the thing about trying to name two chapters, is sometimes they feel more like a homogenous kind of, like, a first part and a second part and other times they have like a sort of discrete difference in this case the the first chapter we read is predominantly a dream sequence um that's like very different than the sort of very dramatic real life stuff that happens in the second chapter we read um so i just kind of chose what happens in that one even though that there's some important stuff that also happens in the first yeah, it's like kind of hard, especially when it comes to like having two chapters, like mashing them together almost to make a chapter title, because maybe something you like happens either in the first one or the back end of the chapter. And it's like one of those where I was thinking about it, it was like, you know, Leo's dad starts a podcast or something really like silly or dumb. Yeah, like it could even just be something about or the fact that he met his dad for the first time. Like there's a lot of like important Things I could have zeroed in on. Yeah, I don't know. I think it was just easiest to make a pithy pun about it. But yeah, the first chapter is important for the simple fact that he, I guess, meets his dad in like a, in a magical sense, because it's a dream, but like not really a dream, because it's real, because he's there, but he's not, because not all of him. There are plenty of gold mines when it comes to this chapter as well as like as another one like Leo gets shot down or Leo gets shots fired like something you could just play with like that type of slang. That's true. There's the there's some uh, I'm sure you can make a laser pun. There's a lot that happens in the second chapter, but the first chapter is um is interesting because we get a little bit of like weird backstory as is the record and custom of like having a dream sequence. That sort of reveals stuff, but for whatever reason, there's like a limited amount of knowledge that can be revealed. Either it's like that old chestnut with like someone like Chiron where he like knows what's happening, but can't reveal it for whatever reason. Or in this case, it's both that and like a sort of spotty connection interruptus situation. This is like maybe one of the most literal examples of interruptus we've ever had, where it's like literally their connection and understanding each other is fuzzy. Yeah, and I think we're going to be getting a little ahead about this, but it's like one of those things like I've noticed, especially with this new book series, is that Interruptus is working a little differently compared to Percy Jackson, where it was happening every other chapter. Whereas like when it comes to these chapters, I feel like 
a lot of the chapters actually carry over from the last ones, kind of like, whereas, like, in Percy Jackson, at least with the Lightning Thief and Sea of Monsters, each chapter almost seemed kind of, like, self-contained. Like, yes, like, they kind of talk a little bit about what happened in the yeah. last chapter. But for the most part, when it comes to these chapters, like, they carry a lot of weight, as we see in this chapter. Leo remembers everything kind of about what happened with Medea and, you know, they have to go to Oakland and things like that. Like that, I love that they have to carry that over. But also we have like the internal monologue as someone that's been taken over by Medea in that way. It's like, oh man, I almost killed Jason. It was so easy. I could have done it. But we get that weight, which I love about it. Yeah, I find that the internal monologues in this series are a bit more like emotionally deep, if that makes sense. Like they're very like, self-reflective i feel like just like the perspective of of percy um when we would get sort of his emotions they felt a little bit flat sometimes and i don't even know if that like had to do with an age thing but it also maybe is just like the demographic of the books there's like a lot of differences but like yeah especially i find in i was gonna say really piper and leo it's hard with jason because his like memory is off but for the characters who remember who they are they have all this like really intense backstory that they often ruminate over and like we have this sort of like third person omniscient narrator who like knows that leo is feeling all these like kind of really horrible self-flagellating emotions about like no matter what his mom's death was his fault and like this weird sort of like spiraling logic where he thinks like oh well even if he didn't like set the machine shop on fire then ultimately the reason that like this revenge was being sought against him is like why she died like his presence around her was which is like a typical kind of like hero's story too where it's like oh my proximity to my loved ones puts them in danger um this is kind of similar to the annabeth thing a little bit i think also like when it comes to like percy jacks it's a little more poignant where we think about the age of those people because like when you're a kid, you don't really think about, like, you don't self-reflect as much as, like, you keep, like, moving forward. I mean, it forward. depends if you're a weird, like, kid, because, <laughs> you know what I mean? It really depends on your personality. Here's the thing, though. Most kids are kind of jerks sometimes because they'll point out things without thinking about things and dwell. I mean, most people are kind of jerks, so I do see what you're saying, though. It's like the, the filter isn't quite there, and I do think Percy has a different personality because he's kind of, like, a little bit more optimistic i think than a lot of the characters in this is that like a stretch to say well here's the thing as well as like when it comes to percy jackson at least with like his character traits he brushes a lot of things off and doesn't really dwell on it because again he's a he's a teenager but here's the thing when it comes to like these uh, teenagers which is a little different is like again you, you i think you brought up a really good point of like they're very self-reflective i think most of them probably have, like, an anxiety disorder of some sort because, like, some of them, like, dwell on certain things. Yeah, like, that's kind of the vibe I get from all of them, especially, I would say, Piper and Leo, where they have, like, a lot of, like, insecurity, I sense, like, especially... um it gets like sort of meta in this chapter where before we get into the dream sequence stuff, it sort of discusses his like feelings of being manipulated by Medea and like the embarrassment about that, which is kind of interesting. And then also like his various layers of like shame that like the way that she made him betray Jason and like say all these things about how he always gets the spotlight and I don't get any attention all that that was like based in a real insecurity he has you know like that's part of why he feels so ashamed is like it played on an existing thing he felt and this is why I like Heroes of Olympus is it emphasizes like these insecurities because realistically if you're gonna be like a hero of the sort you're gonna have some of these problems like when it comes to the hero's journey even in like stories like I'll just use Star Wars because it's easy it's like you know, Luke has a lot of insecurities. You look at, like, a lot of other, like, stories. A good example of this actually is in, like, Lord of the Rings. Like, Frodo's like, oh, man, do I have to do this? But by the end, he, like, completely fails. But it's not him that, you know, does the ring. It's, you know, it's Schmeagol slash Golem and also Sam, um, Sam, where you have, like, these, you know, everyone has to prop each other up because what makes a realistic person, or at least with, especially with these characters, is that, they have these doubts, they have like these reflections. And even when it comes to this, I feel like I love the confrontation we get with like Leah, where he's like bringing things up to his dad. Like, yeah, this might be the only chance that I get. So I'm going to like let him have it. And his dad's like, totally different. Yeah, he's he's just very different personality wise than some of the other characters we've like met so far, because he 
like what you said, he has doubts. And I think that that's like a very stark difference from someone like Percy Jackson, who like he oh, even if he was like reluctant and maybe like the closest you could get was like he had some fish out of water kind of vibes, especially in the earlier books of that series where he's like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I, for the life of me, refuse to learn anything about Greek mythology, even though it's life or death for me, like that kind of stuff. But he kind of has this weird unearned confidence anyway. He has this like slapdash ability to like just forge ahead and like s- succeed from like, I don't know, just random happenstance. He just kind of lucks out. He's one of those kind of guys. Well, I don't really get that from Leo at all. He's so like self-flagellating he's really hard on himself he basically blames everything for himself and like obviously like you know any character is going to have some doubts and some you know sense of shame and things like that i mean even percy had that at some point but like it seems to be like a central part of leo's character like i feel like anytime we get any look into his internal monologue it's all like him feeling like he's guilty of something he's responsible for all these bad things happening and don't even get me started on on piper she also has that for complicated reasons i mean she literally has kind of decided to betray her friends so you know yeah like even at the end of this chapter we see this with like leo with like festus where festus is just like a smoldering wreckage and he feels like he is the at the absolute like rock bottom because he couldn't save you know, this dragon from like laser blasts and rockets, like no one could possibly think about that. But he puts that blame on himself because who else can he blame but himself? Because he doesn't have like, I don't want to say, it's not like he has a filter, but it is one of those things where he's more willing to like, you know, basically be his worst enemy by overthinking or being very anxious of something rather than saying the external problems that occur. Everybody's met a Leo or sometimes they are a Leo, you know, like everyone has that weird impulse in them to like blame themselves for something that's definitely like out of their hands um and i think that that makes him very relatable um it's also just sad though like seeing his internal thoughts um extrapolated kind of really bums me out because it's he's like a nice kid who tries really hard um and in some ways um compared to like some of our other protagonists we've met he's like just doing his best like i don't know he he could be doing much worse also the cool thing about leo as well is that we get this all internally, whereas like his external, you know, appearance is kind of like being jokey and things. But it's it reminds me a lot of like when people like suffer from like depression. Some people like that, have, like for, I know from experience of having depression, like it's easier to tell jokes and stuff to make other people laugh. But inside, you just don't feel good. Right. It's like a deflection. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely the sense I get from him. This is th- this is a very heavy laden chapter with all of that kind of complicated stuff and then he's already in that mindset and then him sort of drifting off to sleep which is like even that is like another fraught thing about his personality right where he he's like such a control freak he's on the festus and he's already like worried that something bad is going to happen with festus which is kind of foreshadowing the next chapter and oh right i was gonna say i almost forgot um the thing with uh with jason he's able to see this like trail which apparently is going to lead them to the other wind god they're supposed to meet. Um, the, Piper, again, is being cagey and weird about, th- you know, them going to the Bay Area, and she's not totally revealing what's happened. Also, like, they don't remember because of what happened with Medea and, like, their own sort of brain erase situation that was happening in the department store. So it's it's kind of a, a weird situation where they're, they're trying to decide where to go, um, and for some reason, Jason is able to see this faint trail i'm assuming that's because he's a son of zeus i guess i would imagine so though every time they kept talking about it i thought they were saying chemtrails for a second no, and I was getting, chemtra- yeah like mm. let's not <laughs> yeah, let's not get started bit. on chemtrails though one time i was <laughs> at a flea market and i saw a guy with a t-shirt that was about chemtrails and i was like imagine being so into a conspiracy theory you get like a t-shirt about it that just seems like an anyway i'm getting off track Yeah, no, it was just like a funny thing that I kept thinking of. But, you know, it's just one of those dumb, silly things. Though I think maybe we should get into kind of the summary of this uh, chapter. It's very straightforward, but not at the same time. Leo and the gang are like flying. Medea's whole place has been exploded, which is, you know, in Percy Jackson logic. I mean, 
they're doing pretty well. One explosion's pretty good. Uh, Percy Jackson would have had like <laughs> one, one explosion. Normally, he does the explosion much earlier. Well, normally, like the explosion comes with like a bus or a, a gymnasium yeah, or you, a school, some sort of school-based explosion. I'm surprised demigods don't have like a gigantic folder of like just stuff in the FBI or the NSA just has on them about. Well, there's just a lot of like weird explosions and stuff that are kid related. There's there's some sort of very clandestine group that likes to explode things. Um, I, I guess that is kind of what happens to Percy, though, right? Where he gets, like, a sort of international man hunt <laughs> after him. That's the good thing about this, at least, is that they don't have, like, this manhunt. But what happens is Leo and the gang are, like, flying in the air. They're, you know, flying like a G6. Oh, God, why did I just use that? Oh, man, I just aged myself. That's a deep that cut. That is That's so old. What year is it? <laughs> you know what? Being in quarantine, it feels like 1998, so... It doesn't really matter at this point. Yeah. Oh, man. Wow. I can't believe I just went there. Thanks, Brain. Uh, But they're flying, and they're kind of like trying to figure out, oh, maybe we should land because Festus isn't feeling good, but also we still have to get to Oakland. And also, at the same time, they're also suspending, like, Coach Hedge in, like, a cage. So any moment now that could fall. Mm, Yeah. You can't forget about the fact that they have two cages one of which is filled with venti and the other has coach hedge in it like just as a sidebar yeah it reminds me a lot of like oh man i know it's in clash of the titans there's actually like an eagle or a crow that like grabs up i think princess andromeda in like a bird cage and flies it away i might be misremembering this but that's like greek mythology more stuff to add to that is that referenced in unfortunate events or am i misremembering no 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 yes wait yes yes because there's the part with the snake cage when they go to the end yeah, there's a cage, but isn't there also giant eagles? No, there's the net. So in the in the slippery slope, when they get all the 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 snow scouts, that must be intentional. I see. The more I do the show, the more I realize other books are like so completely influenced by Greek mythology. Also, I'm like, huh, oh, I see. It's everywhere. Um, not just in explicitly Greek mythology books. Well, that might also just be like Daniel Handler's just like, I'm going to be pretentious oh, well, and talk the, the about stuff. The man loves a reference, for sure. Anyway, we're we're getting sidebarred. Yeah, and what happens is like Leo's like kind of tired, bleary-eyed, but Jason can like see the scent, same as with Festus. And I love kind of like the poignant moment where like Jason's like, yo, dog, you're, you're not a machine. Get some Zs, brah. Yeah, so that's what I was saying um, about the the how that betrays a certain part of his personality where like he is so quick to blame himself that and like such a control freak that he literally like refuses to go to sleep and they're like when was the last time you have slept you need to stop and then of course he sleeps and has like a a weird creepy dream sequence with his dad but like yeah so what happens is surprise surprise he goes to sleep and a mysterious thing happens he actually meets his dad and it turns out that his dad has like this pirate radio station that's like able to communicate because as we find out in this chapter zeus has locked out all of the communique from mount olympus no one ever goes in no one ever goes out type of mentality except the chocolate always goes out for some weird reason uh but as we see with this is that leo and hephaestus kind of have a heart to heart he kind of gives him some information about these giants that were pretty much created as almost like the nega olympians where like they all have like corresponding moments where like they're supposed to be against the olympians yeah we get a lot of um like sort of uh bare bones mythology background in this chapter there's just a lot of like hephaestus being like by the way in case you didn't know this is the titans they're here and they're descended from these folks and we're descended from them and we killed this guy like it's it's sort of like a big chart yeah, there's a lot of those moments as well as, like, Leo and Hephaestus have, like, a heart-to-heart. Though, Hephaestus is a little different than what we see with all the other gods, but we will get to that. Because I find this to be so fascinating as it's like the, do not interfere, but if we interfere, more bad things happen. And Leo wakes up just as they uh, collide with, like, a rocket and laser beams as the next chapter kind of opens up with them falling to their death. But before we get to that... B, what did you think of this first chapter? Well, I mean, we kind of got into a lot of the weird cerebral stuff with uh, Leo, which is a lot. Um, And then it sort of, I guess, sets the scene for then his, like, kind of fraught conversation with his dad. It's the typical tone, I guess, you have come to expect when demigods meet their parents, wherein they go, hey, uh remember me it's cool that you're here now but i've also like almost died a few times and i'm a child so it would have been cool if you like 
gave me more of a heads up. And then there's the typical excuse, of course, that we've come to expect from the gods, which is that you can't interfere, blah, blah, blah. In fact, interference is bad. We get a whole lot of like backstory about that with uh, with Zeus and like the fact that he's like blocking communication, doing this sort of like la la la, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil thing, where pretending that things aren't happening is somehow supposed to like make everything calm down and prevent this like cycle of mythical events from happening again. It's almost like Zeus is like out of sight, out of mind. Don't worry about it, everybody. Yeah, it's literally like that. That's his sort of logic. And it's I mean, let's be honest, that's a very heavy handed metaphor for the mortal world, is it not? Kind of a little bit, because a lot of it has to do with like when it comes to these situations, it looks like the equivalent of uh, there's a scene in The Naked Gun where Leslie Nielsen's telling a bunch of people to stay away. But behind him is a, you know, a blowed up like fireworks factory that's going off and people can't resist not looking <laughs> at it. But even like when it comes to like Mount Olympus and stuff, it's so weird that he's like trying to like disrupt this flow of like communication in this way of like, no, no, no one can talk to their kids or anything. Maybe if uh, we leave them alone, like they'll all either kill each other or the threat will just be benign. Yeah. It's, it's a very strange logic, especially considering the ending of Percy Jackson, wherein we kind of think that we've like restructured everything and made it very clear, like, oh, they should communicate with their kids. But it's actually like, that's why this is happening. It's like a weird sort of ego backlash because the gods were like, we were wrong. Boo hoo. I hate it here. See, here's the thing, especially when it comes with, if we relate this to history, like when it comes to like the American Revolution, or we look at like the French Revolution is that after something gets toppled, there's always going to be these weird type of growing pains where they're not sure. They'll either like veer in one extreme or the next to the point of where it's just, we don't know what to do. So we'll try to keep to the old ways, but make new ways. And at the end, like when it comes to like Zeus and everything, I think he also has like this hubris where he thinks he's right. Though, as we see in Percy Jackson, he's most definitely probably wrong with doing this. It's probably going to hurt them more than people probably think. Yeah, of course. It's, I mean, it's like tale as old as time of trying to avoid the fate and therefore you create the circumstances that make that thing happen like every other story that involves prophecy like he's a god he should know this it's kind of obvious um which is i i don't know i it is frustrating to like keep in mind like yes of course gods are different in this universe they are pretty fallible and they make a lot of decisions based on their ego in this case hephaestus makes a point to say actually when they're wrong that's when they feel like they need to be praised and affirmed the most which um really sums up how the gods function in this universe where it's like they're not all knowing they're just very powerful and they're so powerful in fact that they feel like they deserve a certain level of respect and to be revered and whatever else this like weird back to basics like tradition that zeus is appealing to even though they are often very very wrong so to translate to modern speak the gods are just gigantic jerk influencers I got it now. Yeah, or like they're just like a very traditional kind of person, right? Like if you've ever like met like a kind of like weird bigoted person who's like, we should get back to old family value. Like, you know, anybody who appeals to like when things were great in the good old days, you know, like the all in the family theme song or something like that's kind of the energy I'm getting from Zeus. Like, oh, things were different back in the day. Like it wasn't good back in the day for a whole lot of people. Well, yeah. And especially like when it comes to like what they're thinking about, like the good old days is like the sense of like nostalgia. They're remembering only only the good times and not the bad times because if we look oh, at like the 1950s not. or they're remembering the bad times and they don't care because it doesn't well, affect them well no it doesn't affect them but if we look at like the 1950s and stuff people were like scared completely senseless about like the threat of like a nuclear apocalypse and stuff to the point of where during the cuban missile crisis people were like uh we're just gonna go to the hills and stuff and now we look back at that with like weird reverence in many ways like like ah uh, uh, yes when things were traditional it's the same i mean like i don't think rick is 
dumb. He knows that he's making this a, a very clear metaphor for like appeal to tradition and how people think that that'll solve their current problems, but it actually in some ways creates them. Um, they all feel very like sort of ego bruised about the Percy Jackson situation. I mean, even like Hephaestus says like that young upstart Percy Jackson, he suggested this and proved us wrong because we really did need the help from the demigods. And if we had followed Zeus's plan, we would have been screwed. And like he was right and they were wrong. It almost also feels like a weird, like, ageist problem, almost, where it's, like, the old people don't want to take the advice of, like, new people or, like, younger people, or sometimes younger advice can be a little better than older advice, and also vice versa sometimes. Because it has the perspective of now and not of the past, yeah. Yeah, there's there's a lot of things, especially when it comes to the gods. Like, if we look at Zeus, like, it, we, we say, like, why is he doing all this stuff? Remember when he had the big pact? Like, we're not going to have any kids anymore. Well, 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 this nice ingenue, this beautiful woman. Well, uh, now I have Thalia and this Jason fellow now, and I have no idea what to do. Yeah, it's um, it's pretty frustrating. We know that this whole plan that Zeus has isn't going to work. And Hephaestus even says so. He's like, all of us know deep down this isn't going to work, but he's stubborn and weird. And that's why Hephaestus has to have like this this bizarre setup where he's like made this pirate radio broadcaster that's somehow able to get into Leo's dreams because they're not they're like disallowed from using iris messages and stuff like which is so draconian and intense as a response to the situation where like Zeus is just like no communication at all that'll solve everything yeah because again it's like you know out of sight out of mind but as we look within this chapter as well like I love kind of the perspective that Hephaestus kind of gives because we're so used to, like, the Hermes perspective of just, like, well, I didn't want to interfere because of this. But we look at, like, you know, uh, Hephaestus, and he's like, you know, I was there. I wanted to talk to you, like, when your mom died, but I also went to your science fair. I, I loved your device that you made. But also at the same time, like, gods and stuff, our consciousness, which is going to be a weird metaphysical thing of, like, we're not always the one person. Like, we're, we could be in multiple different places at once and kind of, like, if we're all put together, like, we turn people into, like, pillars of salt and, like, really, like, Sodom and Gomorrah type of stuff. Like, I mean, don't... yeah, that's, like, some, you know, Judeo-Christian stuff. But, like, I mean, Greek gods, too, are, like, they all have, like, their own weird ego situation. We've seen it before with, like, Ares on the beach when he turns into his true godly form and you're not supposed to look or you burn up or you turn into a pillar of salt. <laughs> Did you ever see that, um... That tweet that's like pretty recent where it's like the angel be not afraid all the time the angel looks like this and it's like just a bunch of eye emojis. Yeah. Yeah. If, have you ever seen like I'm about to say everyone look into the Bible but like if you ever like read like the description of like angels. Oh my God. They're so frightening. Just like a wheel of eyeballs. Yeah. Spinning around. Not great. Um, I think even in this case Hephaestus's non- like concentrated form is pretty horrible horrible for uh, leo to to view because that's like the first thing he sees in his dream sequence right where he's like so close to his face that he has to cross his eyes to see which is like why would he do that why would he introduce himself in such a way where he's like here's my craggy nightmare face it's this close to you like i don't really understand that approach well i think that's a more honest approach because like that's just how hephaestus looks like i feel like it would be disingenuous if he showed them like i'm this sexy hunky man oh i know i'm not saying he should have like cloaked himself or anything i'm just saying he was like an inch away from leo's face when he gets there and he's like oh what the frick he even said what does he say he does he say something about like oh holy mother and he's like no father yeah no exactly like there are moments like that like there's a lot of humor with this and especially like we get the description of like what Hephaestus looks like and like how he's like this. I don't want to use like the word like deformed, but like he's like he's kind of like a very unique looking fellow. He's pretty injured. He's like very scarred, which I guess is like from. He's disfigured. I feel like that'd be the better word to use, right? Yeah. Um. He has a lot of injuries and marks on his face because he's the god of like workshops and that kind of thing and he's like working in forges and is that why he's deformed or oh, was he already ugly right because he was cast down he was already ugly because Hera yeeted him right off of Mount Olympus so oh yeah because there's like something wrong okay so never mind he already but he also was injured right because like that's part of his person like his character is that he's like always working 
in like these dangerous environments. I'm not sure how much of how he looks has to do with how he already looked and how much of it has to do with the fact that he's like always in like workshops. I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah. I mean, normally when I see my friends in workshops, they have like these big bushy beards and we listen to like Metallica and stuff. Well, that's also, he's also like a hob, I almost said a hobbit. He's a hermit, kind of like a hobbit in a way, but because he, he like doesn't care about how he looks to people because he's like this sort of isolated, you know, mad genius, I, I guess is kind of his, his personality. He wants to be like in the workshop, not deal with real people, not deal with organic beings he kind of looks like the crazy old kook in gravity falls but i can't remember his name mcgucket yeah mcgucket <laughs> thank you oh I, i'll never forget mcgucket <laughs> mcgucket yeah no exactly that's kind of like what you, that that's the look that i'm i'm seeing i love that character oh yeah no totally yeah I, I i could see that yeah he's like i was picturing almost like a very scary santa claus i guess because he has this sort of like grandfatherly energy that's like it's like jovial but a little scary you know what i mean i'm about to be like really nerdy b and i apologize everybody but okay. in my head here and kind of reminds me of in the elder scrolls universe dwarves don't quite exist the dwalmer are kind of like they just disappear and in um elder scrolls 3 more when you see one of them and that's kind of like where we get the stereotype of like dwarves where this one has like He's just horribly fat and like is in like a spider chair and stuff. And that's what I'm thinking about. Kind of like he just looks like almost like a half dwarf, half, you know, man, half machine, but all heart. All heart. Yeah, he has this very interesting personality to him. Uh, he calls Leo boy, which is like this sort of alienating phrase that's somewhere between not calling him anything and calling him uh, son, which is really what he is, but like that's kind of strange because they've never met and he wasn't really his dad in a functional sense. And this is the second time we've kind of gotten something like this because in the beginning of the chapter, Jason calls Piper Pipes and she hates that so much. Yeah, the term of endearment really bothers her, which again, I think is a weird guilt thing. That's like a separate reason, I think. She's like, oh, don't call me that term of endearment. Is that also because that's what his, uh, what her, uh, Dad yeah. calls her, so that's like a touchy subject. So there's like other reasons why she wasn't super keen on that. But yeah, in this case, uh, Leo's like, oh, he's calling me boy, which is strange. Um, but also, he could be calling me son, which would be weirder. So I guess I'll just deal with that. See, and that's like a complicated thing, especially with like when it comes to like uh, was I was gonna say honorifics, but when it comes to like people addressing people, it's like a weird thing where like. This happens a lot of like in adventure stories or it happens a lot in like fantasy where uh, kids don't want to be called like boy or girl or something because they want to be more like manly when you're on like an adventure almost. Well, isn't that like God of War, right? Yeah. Doesn't he call boy. his kids boy? <laughs> Come over here, boy. <laughs> boy. Like, yeah. Um, which is kind of a good metaphor too because he's sort of like this weird estranged father figure and is a god. So there's some parallels there. Oh, no, no, don't you say that about Kratos. Kratos is a god tier dad. Tells dad jokes and is nice and is awful. Yeah. Uh. Eventually, in the end, I think. But yeah, the, in this case, the, even like the, the narrative acknowledges that where it says, um, Hephaestus called him boy as if Leo were an annoying machine part, an extra washer maybe, that had no clear purpose, but that Hephaestus didn't want to throw away for fear he might need it someday. Not exactly heartwarming. A very interesting peer into the psyche of Hephaestus there. Well, we see also other things as well as like, Leo's like, how does this guy even relate it towards me? And then we see like the moment, like the quirk that Festus has where he pulls something out and starts messing with it, like tinkering, the same way that Leo has been doing throughout this entire book with like pipe cleaners and stuff. Right. Yeah. I always find that interesting, right? When like we have a, a moment where the demigods meet their parents and they see some sort of reflection of themselves in this figure that's basically like a deadbeat parent that they never met before but like there's this echo of like oh i came from that i see how i came from that um which is like heartwarming and kind of sad also because like they're not close um and again we have like the excuse of the way the mythology works and like why the gods can't be close to their kids that excuse i guess can cover a multitude of sins while also being kind of a bummer and i feel bad about it you know what i mean <laughs> It's one of those things that I feel like they're bringing it up more and more to the point of where I feel like Rick Ryden might actually just address it, like, 
<laughs> at face value almost at this point. I mean, because... it has been addressed because it was addressed at the end of Percy Jackson when they, they were promised to like claim them and stuff. There's definitely been some heavy handed stuff about that. But yet we're still bringing it up. To the point of where I feel like it's going to be something that's going to have to go on. Well, it's like a tension, right? Because like they're you want them to act like real parents, like human parents, but they can't. And like it's hard to discern the line between how much of that is actually just the way that gods work. And like there's just no way for them to be involved in their kids lives in a way that wouldn't ultimately hurt them anyway. Or is it because they're like so powerful and like ego driven that they don't feel like they need to and like it's sort of like they don't like to be told what to do because that's kind of the vibe i get from zeus for sure i feel like a lot of this has to do with a lot of like gods and a lot of like these concepts are almost like so ingrained into their nature it's like the equivalent of like gravity like we know how gravity works you throw something on the ground and gravity takes it it's almost like they're like drawn towards that almost like the stars will always be aligned in this way we're pretty much it's almost like what's the it's like a wheel almost if we use wheel of time logic of like it's always going to be this problem that they're never going to be able to fix like they can change things about the wheel but in the end it's still going to repeat in this way because if you change the wheel like heroes will always go on quests right you mentioned that last episode i think which is like kind of true as far as like the way this universe works where there's like certain key things that happen in the cycle of mythical events or whatever and like the details change but the overall like series of events is pretty similar um and they're kind of i guess unpreventable well we see this a lot in like norse mythology i mean you have like the iconic symbol of like the snake eating its own tail through infinity yeah the ouroboros yes so we have like even in mythology, they, they've talked about this because we have these patterns. I mean, like, if we look at just life itself, you're born, you get older, you die. Maybe you might repeat it in some religions. Some others, we, you know, we'll figure that part out. Uh, but when it comes to, like, this one-on-one conversation, it's one of those where it's both a tragedy, but also Leo's still getting advice from his dad the best way possible. Yeah, it's an interesting conversation they have because he's sort of helpful. And I think in a lot of ways, as far as like godly parents go, he's pretty actively helpful and he's trying really hard to reach out to Leo in a way that's kind of heartwarming, right? Like he defies Zeus. He constructed this whole radio. I mean, he already had it, but he's using this pirate radio to reach out to him and try and talk to him about this stuff and give him advice, despite the fact that they have a spotty signal. Um, and it's, again, the interruptus problem occurs and we don't really get the full picture, which narratively is more interesting because we don't like get it spelled out for us what's happening. But there's a few warnings here and there, and one of which is a very imminent warning for something that happens in the very next chapter. We get some hints, some background stuff. Uh, There's also, like, a lot of hints just in what he doesn't say, where it's like the narrative acknowledges that that Leo's like, it was as if he was holding something back, right? Like, it's like, oh, the demigods were sent from Paws, Camp Half-Blood. Are we... This is, again, another hint that there's maybe another camp. There's something else going on with demigods. Like, there's sort of reading between the lines that's happening. I mean, if there is another camp, it must be so bad that no one can acknowledge it. Or maybe it's like one of those, like, out of sight, out of mind. Oh, man, that's bad. Well, again, it's it's the conflict between Greek and Roman, which we've talked about, too, of, like, the, the Jason thing of, like, how he, he's not supposed to be at Camp Half-Blood, but he is. And if he knew who he was, then it wouldn't work somehow. And if I know my Rick Riordan, and I think I know him real well, this guy has, like, a man crush on the Civil War... So I have a bad feeling about this in many ways, where it's going to be very Civil War related. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Two sides that are basically the same, but somehow different. It's like the Butter Battle book. Oh, no. Or was it the Chocolate War? Remember that book? Yeah. I it's, I wish I didn't. It's not a good that's, one. It's not fun. Or oh, The only book that I like that's kind of like that is, what is it? I Am Cheese, but that's a little different of a book. I don't know that one. I was, I was thinking... <laughs> 
<laughs> I was thinking of the f- the famous wild thornberries re- like a uh, episode where they there's two tribes of monkeys and they have different length tails but then they wear armor that hides their the length of their tails and they realize they're the same. Anyway, that's a very highbrow Nickelodeon reference we're going for. Only the finest on this program. Well, that's not the first time they've done that either. There's the Great Divide episode of Avatar the Last Airbender or like these two warring people it's all the same. Anyway, I don't. I'm not looking forward to the conflict between whatever this camp or group of other demigods is and the demigods we have heretofore known about. So it's gonna be a bad time, probably. That's why Jason doesn't know who he is. Let's be honest. Hey, all I gotta say is let demigods be bygones sometimes, <laughs> or not. Let's like hope they're they they could be bygones according to the end of this chapter. Um, oh yeah, because as yeah, we, uh... I, what other we get like a little bit of detail sort of fleshed out. Um, he talks about um... he brings up the earth again and how pretty much this evil mistress of some sort keeps stirring. Right, we get a little bit of backstory about her. Um, he can't say her name again because of interrupt us. We still don't know the name of the earthen lady. So she's the uh, the patron of Medea, right? We determined that in l- the last couple chapters. Still don't know her name. She also has to do heavily with the earth in many ways of some sort, because they always refer to her. And associated with giants, too. And the giants are specifically built to function as these, like, vengeful beings that want to destroy the gods because of what they did to the Titans. That's kind of their their general purpose in mythology and here in this story. I gotta be. I'm going to spoil this. It's Karen. She's coming up there to speak to their (laughs) managers. It's, ca- I mean, basically, <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, no. My mom, it's it's very weird how my mom has gotten self-aware about Karens, where she's like, I don't mean to be a Karen, but, and then she, like, yells at someone, like, from customer service, and I'm like, but that's still, you're still being <laughs> Karen. <laughs> I mean, this is going to be a joke, but that's, like, the equivalent of, like, usually when you say something, I don't want to be this, but it usually gets bad. No, exactly. That exactly. So it's like, oh no, the Karens have they've risen up and become self aware. Or what is it? Have you seen like the meme of like when you have a couple Karens, it's like a complaint. When you have fifty Karens, it's like a clash action lawsuit. It's like I'll have to send it to you. It's funny. I got an email from Google saying that I could be a part of a class action lawsuit and I can win up to five dollars. And I oh was like, gosh. I don't care. Why are you sending me this? Neither do I care about, like, $5. I guess I'll go to the store and get, what, a gallon of ice cream, maybe? How much could a banana cost? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So the next chapter to go through it is they wake up, and I'm going to summarize this as quickly as possible, because not really much happens. Uh, Festus blows up, and they, they, they crash, and then... This is like the Swamp of Sadness scene or like any scene where something sad happens. Oh, yeah. Didn't. OK, you kind of gave a hint to me about this, right? Like last chapter um, or last episode, you were like, you know, with the, with Festus, the thing with pets and also robots is a lot of times they sacrifice themselves or something bad happens. And it's a sort of morally building moment for one of the protagonists. Like we, we saw this coming a mile away and you kind of really drilled at home uh, last episode. So. Full transparency. I wasn't giving you a hint. I was just wanted to talk about the Iron Giant. Yeah, I mean, I do love the Iron Giant and various other ripoffs of that same premise if i remember correctly we were t- talking about like bestowing humanity on something that is inanimate which we see here and they pretty much regard and pretty much pulls the heartstrings and this is very like i don't want to say it's like a by the numbers type of thing oh uh, this is so iron giant literally even like the way that he's like eviscerated and just like in a bunch of different pieces i was like oh no i'm i'm in like third grade again i'm watching the iron giant i'm going to cry it's bad Wait, did you see Iron Giant in theaters, B? I, I think I did. Or, no, I think it was like recently out on like VHS or something or like on TV is when I first saw it. And I just was like a mess. I did see it then in theaters um, when they did like a re-release or whatever. But as far as the first time it was theatrically released, I think I saw it like on TV. Very sad, though. <laughs> I remember seeing it in theaters because I remember going to the theaters and I was at the age where I was like running up and down the aisles and like doing stuff before the show. And I remember like stubbing my toes the entire time there. I was just in pain. And then watching the movie, I started crying. Then you were in emotional pain. 
Yes. We'll actually have to make a housekeeping thing for the first time. Someone brought up, I actually misremembered two Pokemon movies. The Pokemon oh, no. movie with Mewtwo is the first Pokemon movie. And this, I don't even want to say that it's a sequel because I might be missing like 85 Pokemon movies, but the other one, Pokemon 2000, is a completely different movie. <laughs> Mewtwo always gave me the heebie-jeebies. I think I mentioned that in our last episode. It's just, it's too ki- close to a human. I don't like it. It's going to... Anyway, Iron Giant. It's basically the Iron Giant. It's like a one chapter long version of the Iron Giant. That's what happens. It's real sad. It's one of those poignant moments, especially like only as a robot or something, you can get away with this. We're horribly mutilating them or eviscerating them or like destroying them. Yeah, I, that's a good point, actually. Yeah, the, to really drive home a specific level of, like, destruction of something. Like, you would never say that about, like, Old Yeller, right? Like, you're just reading a book and it's like, an Old Yeller, he was splattered all over the ground. Like, they would never say that about, like, an animal. But I think a robot, you can kind of, you have more leeway with that kind of thing. Well, yeah, you do, because, like, if we look at, like, a good example of this is, like, Where the Red Fern Groans, which is a story that makes me cry every time I think about it. Now we're just like, getting into childhood traumatic, like, movies and books. If we're getting into more childhoods, actually, you know what? Better yet be, I'm going to do something better. Bridge to Terabithia, they never show it, but they imply all the horrific natures of that book. Yeah. But, like, here you have the moment where you can explain it in visceral detail, like, oh, my God, Festus has exploded, his neck and head are connected, but the rest of his body is not. Yeah, they're yeah, they're disconnected. He's like falling apart. Okay, now take a moment to think about if that's like a real animal. This is just everyone screaming, and the book just ends because Rick Ryden has gotten his entire license pulled. Yeah, no, exactly. Like, can you imagine if that happened to Blackjack? If the, like a horse with wings was just exploded, like they would never. But with a dragon, I guess because he's a robot, they can d- describe it more. Still incredibly heartbreaking because we've kind of like anthropomorphize this robot it has sort of like what we've come to know is like i i think the dogification of any kind of like sort of sidekick character that a protagonist would have it's like oh he's kind of like a puppy he's like loyal and friendly like it reminds me a lot of like i think it's the first short circuit or the, i can't remember if it's the first or second one but there's a part where the, i'm going back to this old people talk now is that there's a part where johnny five gets murdered by an axe and he's bleeding out oil and stuff and it's like horrific but because it's a robot it's okay but... it's like yeah robot body horror that's kind of what happens here um it's heartbreaking it like i mean you weren't it's not exactly the same but it is for sure like you know an artax in the swamp of sadness like i have this noble steed you have carried me so far and then in order for us to survive you have died here's the million dollar question what was artax depressed about because that's how you die in the swamp of sadness i i never really got that but i kind of always assumed that the swamp of sadness made you so sad that you couldn't go on and the fact that it was a horse that he was riding on was that atreyu wasn't as like submerged in the sadness swamp so he didn't get affected but because the horse was like up to here like he was more submerged in the sadness juices and that's why he got sad. I don't know. Like, that's like my justification. I don't think he had horse depression unless I'm wrong. I don't know. We, why do we always go back to horses? We always. <laughs> well, I mean, isn't that like our show? Horse girls and horse gay dads. But it's like you think of like. <laughs> yeah, that that would be a very dark ending to horse and around too when. When the horse sinks into a mud puddle and dies. That's like literally the only example I could think of where an animal dies in a in something that actually is that viscerally upsetting. If we're gonna have the sequel, it should have the part where like the horse dad gets horribly injured. There's gonna be a thruple for some weird reason, and the one person's like, (laughs) (laughs) Take my legs, it's like a leg transplant. It's like a her so it's just a person. Yeah, he just becomes a person. Oh. Well, actually, that's the third one where he become he goes to Manhattan or something. <laughs> <laughs> Horse dad takes, and then he like goes around. He's like, you know, I used to be a centaur. It's like you're just a normal guy. <laughs> sure, you are. Whatever. Yeah, that's New York for you. <laughs> oh man, that's yeah, exactly. Like remember, all it those- writes itself really. It really does. B, do you remember like how there's a bunch of movies that are just like, if you need it to be set big, you put it in New York or in Manhattan? 
There's the Muppets take Manhattan. Jason takes Manhattan. Um, what are the other ones? I mean, a fish out of water story is really great in New York because it kind of both works very well because it's a fast paced kind of place. But at the same time, you can't be a fish out of water when you're in New York because there's so many weird things happening all the time. No one even pays attention to you. Yeah, exactly. Because I remember when I went to New York, I was just like, wow, gee whiz, I almost got beat up. Wow. The real New York experience. Fun times. Yeah. And then you just come to L.A. and everyone's just either sad or depressed. Yeah. Um, what were we even talking about? We were talking about animal death, and I guess in this case, whatever, sidekick death, he's not really an animal, but... I mean, like, it's how do you talk about, like, the noble steed or the noble dragon, like, dying in this way? I mean, there are many times where you see this. I was waiting for the part where, like, he reassembles almost like the Iron Giant. Like, the Iron Giant, exactly. Like, because he's so, like, eviscerated in the way where he's, like, just, you know, strewn about, the way that they, like, describe him, right? It literally says, um, hold on, I'm gonna read the description because it's, like, pretty heartbreaking. The dragon had disintegrated, his limbs were scattered across the lawn, his tail hung on the fence. The main section of his body had plowed a trench 20 feet wide and 50 feet long across the mansion's yard before breaking apart. What remained of his hide was a charred, smoking pile of scraps. Only his neck and his head were somewhat intact, resting across a row of frozen rose bushes like a pillow. Like, oh my god! Rough go of it, buddy. B, are the last words from Festus? Rosebud. Oh, God. <laughs> Might as well. No, instead he does a uh, Morse code, which this is the sort of connecting thread between the Hephaestus dream sequence and what happens with Festus. Very weird how close their names are. Um, different meanings entirely. But the fact that before sort of uh, Festus phases out in the dream sequence and they're sort of breaking up, he says something along the lines of like, no machine lasts forever and that things can always be reused or like repurposed. And we see that how like Leo's like holding, you know, Festus and he's like really sad, but like he wishes for his dad and literally like he wishes upon a star and like take this up to the shop or the great garage in the sky such a whimsical moment I, it's kind of like even hard to imagine cinematically right like he takes the head of a dragon which is like a hundred pounds and he's like dad do me a solid and the head floats away into the sky kind of like that scene in princess and the frog where like the the uh lightning bug becomes a star do you know what i'm talking about yeah, i know exactly what you're talking about <laughs> Spoiler alert, I guess, for Princess and the Frog. See, this is also not the first time we've had this symbolism before. This happened in The Lightning Thief with Medusa's head, where it beco it comes back relevant. That's true. A lot of uh, you know, narratively important heads we have going on. Well, I mean, B, sometimes you have to get a head in the story. Oh, no. All right. Well, you've just besmirched Festus's memory. <laughs> with the bad pun, so um, you're not invited to do the homily. It's what he would have wanted. He, <laughs> them, I'm not sure. What, what what do you give to a robot? I think he's a he, right? Yeah. I guess so. That's what they've been using for him. Well, if it's like a robot or like it's like a flying machine, normally you bestow like lady names. That's true. Yeah, or like a like a boat or something. I don't know. It's a, he's a. He's a he for whatever reason they've decided to give it to him. He's, he has no gender. He is a robot dragon. There's so many reasons why he would not care. But <laughs> Yeah, but you, you have these moments where like you have like this humanity almost where who knows if it's going to come back in this way. Do you feel like uh, Festus's head's going to come back in one way, shape, or form where Jason or someone needs it? Yeah, no, I thought that there was going to be, like, a sort of homing device that would beep, and then he would just freeform. Yeah, exactly. Not the case. Can, doesn't that super suck, right, that all the monsters that they've killed immediately reform, and then the robot dragon that they love very much can't? It's like, that's not fair. Yeah, we'll see what's going to happen with that, because we know most likely they're going to either rebuild Festus, that might be, like, Leo's character arc or something, or maybe Festus comes back bigger, badder, and more... BA? Yeah, I mean, so we it is sort of like the Iron Giant premise in that we can rebuild him. It's not like a sort of like magical, you know, fix it all where he's just gonna like just come back together in the North Pole or wherever the heck that 
the ending of that movie takes place, but he has to actually actively rebuild him. So she just kind of like sends him off to, I guess, his workshop or something, and then he can be built into something else. It, it's sort of like that, uh, what is it, like the the ship of, like there, there's like a sort of thought experiment where it's like if you keep replacing parts of a ship, at what point does it become a new ship? Like at what point does Festus become a different dragon as opposed to the same one. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, I think it's one of those where, like, I think that's a question of, like, when it comes to, I always like this for, like, robots or, like, things that have consciousness because it's, like, you can replace everything, but is that still the original thing or because it has that consciousness? Ship of Theseus, by the way, is what I was thinking of, which um, is fittingly mythical (laughs) in nature. It's sad and heartbreaking because in many ways, like, Leo is pretty much, like, Festus's avatar in many ways, like they reflect each other and like, you know, beautifully destroyed things and misunderstood things yeah. is Leo's like forte in, into stuff. So we'll see what happens because maybe much like um, the Phoenix, maybe something better will rise out of the ashes, much like maybe Leo might get over like the death of his mom in this way where it isn't his fault. And maybe he might get more confidence and maybe taking everything away because sometimes when you're at your lowest moments, you come up with the better, most amazing ideas sometimes. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested to see what happens with, with Festus because I mean, obviously he's going to become something else, but it's like, it's like, it's this complicated thought experiment, right? Cause he, we don't have, um, his like brain chip. What is it called? The, the chip that's like totally the, fried. The mind chip yeah, or brain whatever chip. Whatever it is. The, the the memory chip thing you know what i'm talking about that's like i guess his essence it's like hard to say um but that's kind of like what leo looks to to be like he's dead jim you know like that's the the signifier that he's like not able to be like come back from where he was I, so i don't know it's, it's an interesting way to look at this especially like a good example of this be is like treasure planet where like when you chase a dream sometimes you lose pieces of you in your adventure Oh, yeah, it's like the cyborg yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah, Long John Silver. Yeah. But you, you have these moments, and who knows what happens, because I always love the line in Batman Begins where it's like, what happens when we fall, Master Bruce? We get right back up. And that's kind of like what they have to do, because now Leo is mad, and there's a highly flammable mansion right in front of them. Yeah, so the 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 mansion is interesting. So I... It's weird that both they get t- totally eviscerated by these lasers, like this defense system, and yet no one comes out to be like, what are you doing here? So they have like a really intense defense system with like lasers that can melt a giant robot dragon. But at the same time, no one's like checking to see why three children fell out of the sky, which I don't know what's happening there. Well, to be fair, B, they are in Nebraska. I think the next neighbor's like four hours away or something. It's real flat. Who knows what's going to happen? B, what do you think is going to be happening next chapter? Because I feel like Leo might be getting a little hot-headed. Yeah. So it basically ends with them saying, oh, you th- we're going to uh, go into the mansion because there's no way for them to get out um, without being totally destroyed by the lasers like what happened to Festus. Um, it's this weird situation where they're like trapped inside the walls of this place despite the fact that like they really shouldn't be and they should have been destroyed on the way down. It's it's like a no way in, no way out kind of thing. I have no idea who they're going to meet in this mansion. I was trying to like read from context clues like what it's supposed to be, but it's not like any kind of um, like landmark I would recognize, I don't think. It's just like, what city are they in again? They mentioned it. Nebraska. Nebraska, right. Like Omaha, right? So I don't... Yeah, Omaha. I can't possibly think of what this could like what mythical being this could be what like important person who they're gonna meet inside of this like heavily armed fortress i think there's some like clues because like when we think of this it's a mansion that has rockets and a laser system it's very militarized and really yeah so it- there's like some sort of like mad scientist person in the walls of this mansion i think yeah or maybe he's a complete donkey and an idiot who knows it, I mean, it feels like a, like a mad scientist kind of thing for you know what I mean. Or it's gonna be like a conspiracy doomsday prepper. He just has everything up just in case. Yeah, that too. Like it has like definite, definite like Bond villain energy. I have no idea who they're about to meet. 
I have a feeling it's going to be like some sort of like mythical thing where like in the case of like Medea or whatever, we're going to like think it's a normal person or like maybe just like a a person who's like understands magic, but like not necessarily from a myth. And they're like, oh, right. They're actually from a myth. They're this person. Uh, but we didn't tell you their name until just now. That happens a whole lot in these books. So I never know if they're going to meet like an actual like new character or if it's just going to be another mythological character it's just like a bond villain how like they're like really like wacky names yeah like blofeld or like goldfinger or like any of those other ones wouldn't it be like really weird if it was like daedalus <laughs> but he's gone now right he's definitely gone sure he's gone he, he just faked his death to get that life insurance policy uh-huh and he's just he's just chilling it up in omaha <laughs> Man, that sounds like a sad exile in my opinion. Not no throw shade to people that live in Nebraska. I'm sure it's nice. I think uh Brandon Sanderson's from Nebraska, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so they yeah, eat. I, I the only thing I know about Nebraska is corn. I think that's it. Is it gonna be a corn villain? <gasps> Maybe oh, no. children of the corn. No, that's not what that's about. It's not made. It's not about children made of corn. Um, I don't know. I have no idea what. Obviously, there's going to be some trauma coping happening. I also know that it's a Jason chapter, so we'll see what he's going to deal with. Uh, he had to go through the whole. I mean, this freaking poor guy has been like comatose or like unaware for ninety percent of this book. I feel like so it'd be good to get a little bit of perspective from him. Yeah, you know those moments in people's lives where you're just like, please make it stop. I just want to remember things. And then like he's like, he remembers things. Oh wait, I remember now. I'm very sad. And then you get like, you know, hypnotized by some weird lady at a store. Um yeah, there's um you get bonked on the head. There's a lot of things that have happened to this guy. You're gonna have that moment where he remembers everything and you get bonked on the head and forget everything again for like two seconds. I remember everything. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's like, he's like, I know exactly who I. <laughs> yeah. Oh God, if that happened, I would like. I don't even know. I would throw my phone across the room. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I think on that note, I think that pretty much wraps it up. Unless there's any more tinfoil hat theories you want to put out there. Um, I don't, I don't really know what's going to happen. I haven't, I don't have like any idea who they're about to meet. Um, I just know that they're going to be kind of like reckoning with a lot of the weird stuff that they've already been reckoning with. I bet, I don't know, is Jason going to sort of ham fistedly try to like comfort Leo in his time of sadness? I don't know. Hey man, it's just a dragon. You know how it goes sometimes. Thanks, Jason. Hey man, what's a dragon? <laughs> no, what, what is it like? I might not remember everything, but you know what? You're my best friend. At least I still have Piper, who is also with us right here, who isn't blown up and not a dragon. He's just really awkward. She's great, unlike you, who's our weird third wheel. You're gross. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> That's like Leo's worst nightmare. Oh, yeah, exactly. Will be. where can they find you on social media? Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at bkellygorman, and you can find me on Tumblr at twinpoetry.tumblr.com. Uh, I did... Finally, that, that article that I was interviewed for was released, which I posted on Twitter if you have missed it, uh, which is uh, on Lifehacker, what to do when your favorite artist has been canceled. It sounds way more controversial and horrible than it really is. Um, it's sort of just like reckoning with a lot of the stuff that we talk about on this podcast of, you know, dealing with complicated artists and creators who might not, you know, mesh with what they're uh, content has to say um if you want to check that out um it's it's pretty good you interviewed me uh you might know Allie from ssr she's in there a few other cool people so check it out yeah check it out read it we'll have a link down below in the show notes if you want to find me on twitter you can find me at suda41 that's s-u-d-a-4-1 if you want to follow our show on twitter that's at halfblood underscore radio we also have a Patreon, Patreon slash Radio Camp Halfblood. We also have a new phone number, so if you dial 714-468-5412. Again, that number is 714-468-5412. So call that number, leave a voicemail. Our mailbag episode will be dropping very, very soon. Just uh, finishing up that editing as, you know, I'm up in Hephaestus' workshop. And sometimes we have some explosions and things and sometimes things get delayed, but uh, we'll get those. Well, I'm Zach. I'm B. And let's keep staying mortal, everybody. See ya. Bye, guys. Bye.